Alrighty, I think we'll get started in a, in a moment. Um, uh, and just a reminder, everyone, that today's session will be recorded. Um, so please tick that box when you join. Um, and as I mentioned in the chat, um, please keep your, your videos off um, and yourselves on mute um, unless you're, you want to ask a question during the question time. Um, and we also will be using the chat function today to, to do um, uh, questions as well. Um, so thank you everyone for, for joining. My name's Georgia Pugh. I'm the program manager for AWI Extension WA. Um, and I'll hand over to Catherine to introduce herself. Hi, yes, uh, thanks Georgia. And thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm Catherine Davies. I'm a development officer um, with Depo based in the Northern office. And um, as Georgia said, we'd like to welcome you to session two of the Depo in AWI Extension WA webinar chip producers tackling tough times. Um, Georgia mentioned it's being recorded and will be available online after the webinar on the DPIRT and AWI websites. So the aim of the webinar is to provide valuable information for sheep producers, which um, people can incorporate into their decision making for the current season. Um, as Georgia said, we've got the chat function, so please use that throughout um, the speakers and we'll have time after each of the speakers to ask a question. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country, the Aboriginal people of many lands which we work and their language groups throughout WA and recognise their continuing connection to the land and waters. We respect the continuing culture of the Aboriginal people and the contribution they make to the life of our regions and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So to kick off the presentations today, um, we're going to start with Greg Tilbrook. Um, Greg's AWN's Wool and Livestock State Manager, and he's um, done something a little bit different today and record, done a pre-recorded video to update us on the wool market. Um, but Greg is also online and will be available after the presentation to answer any questions that you have. Thanks very much, Georgia. Hi, Greg Tilbrook from AWN WA. Um, for those that don't know me, I've been in the wool industry for 20 years and uh, been auctioneering for the bulk of it. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank AWI for asking me to do this podcast in regards to wool markets, where they've been, uh, what our thoughts are at the moment on the current levels and, and where we feel the market will be going forward. So when it comes to marketing wool for clients, obviously, you know, it starts in the shearing shed, we're checking on things there making sure that things are prepared, one, to the code of practice and, and assisting classes to make that decision. But we're also looking at uh, the market and, and if there is a higher discount for uh, higher VM wools at the time, we might be skirting the flanks heavier or taking flanks out. Um, the discount for tender wool, quite great at the moment, so you really don't want it in your main line. So the marketing process starts there to make sure things are right. But then we also look at, um, you know, where markets have been. Uh, you go back to 2018-19, market was at exceptional levels. Uh, you're talking the 2021 20, micron indicators in the $23, $24 mark clean. Uh, we're certainly not at those levels at the moment, but a lot of that market back then was driven by a really good increase in demand, in particular out of China and Europe. Uh, and there were very little stocks, grower stocks. So uh, the market was, uh, keen to buy wool, there wasn't as much around and, and obviously the, the market had that rally at that time. Uh, so other things we're looking at is obviously where the market's been over the last 12 months. And right about now, your 19, 20, 21 micron indicators are sitting in the 90 decile. So for the last 10 years, the market levels that we're currently experiencing, the market's only been above it 10% or less of the time. But when you look at your 17 microns, they're sitting in around the 60 to 70 decile. The main reason for that at the moment is there's been quite a significant drop in demand from the Northern Hemisphere for garments. Interest rates are up, consumer spending's back, and that's obviously flowing through to the price that grow uh, buyers are willing to pay for greasy indicators. So when we're looking at uh, where the market's at, where it's been, where it's tracking. Obviously, we're using deciles. We're talking to the buyers on a regular basis to find out uh, what their thoughts are, where their order levels are at, and 
how things are tracking in terms of supply. A lot of things impact the supply chain. Um, you know, not just greasy, but it's going through into the dumping stage and then the shipping stage. And if you remember through COVID, there was a real shortage of containers, which then impacted on the cost that it was costing the buyers to shift wool up into China, but also the timing. Uh, and from a processing point of view, a lot of the processes through that COVID period weren't running at capacity with a lack of staffing levels. So you've got to look at all things when it comes to marketing wool. Uh, the other one that we're looking at on a regular basis is where the market's been over the last few weeks, uh, certainly talking to the trade and where they're sitting at the moment. The indent business, which is your consistent business week in, week out, that's still pretty firm at the moment and the market has been trading between about a 13 to 13.50 clean range for your 19s to 21s for about three or four months now. To really drive that market to the next level, what we need to see is a big increase in extra demand. And where that extra demand comes in, there's an extra four, five, six containers needed for the next week or two. All the buyers are trying to get access to that. And straight away, that will then drive the market. But that then depends on the volume of wool in the sales as well. Currently, we're predicting quite a large sale post Easter. Uh, due to the extra few days of testing and it's looking like it's going to be over a 50,000 bale sale. Um, trade seems to be able to handle about 40 to 45,000 bales a week at the moment. So it's consistent orders. We need that extra orders in the market to then drive it to the next level. And that's where we're sort of looking at where the current indicators are sitting. We then come back to obviously where they've been tracking. And then we start talking to clients once we've got wool tested to make sure that uh, we've got the valuations correct. We're using the premiums and the discounts, which is another tool to then work out where the discount's set in terms of uh, discounts for mid-break, higher VMs, tensile strength issues and things like that. Uh, so when we do value, will we try to get it obviously as close to market value as we can, give growers all the information as to where the market's been, what our thoughts are like, where it was 12 months ago, and uh, where we see it going forward. And as I just touched on, certainly moving forward at the moment, we're struggling to see where that extra demand will come from. If the market does have less on offer, so if less shearing going on now, less fresh wools, but we do still have quite a lot of wool in store and, and brokers around Australia, not just here, with um, certainly a bit of wool in store waiting to go into sale. So if we do get a bit of a run on the market, there is plenty of wool to come into it. Now, as I touched on, less shearing going on now, so less fresh wool's coming into the market. If the volumes were to get back into the low 40s or higher 30s in terms of the number of bales available each week to the trade, less supply, demand still good with the indent business, you would expect to see the market reasonably firm. If we get some extra business done, then all of a sudden the market will have a rally. From that point of view, you may find that the market is reasonably firm through that April, May, June, July period. But there's a lot of other factors to look at as well. While the offerings are still in the high 40s, that's enough for the trade to handle at the moment. And as I've touched on, we're not seeing the extra business uh, inquiry. And from that point of view, I just don't think there's gonna be a huge amount of upside, certainly short term. Long term, however, the flock is shrinking. There is less merinos going back to merinos. Um, there's less lamb production, which will then flow through into our hogget wool in the 2026 season. So that's also going to be factored into everything, but you've got to look at it at a national point of view. A lot of composites produced in the eastern states. Uh, crossbred wool at the moment is really struggling in the market on the back of India, uh, certainly not taking as much as what it was, say, prior to COVID. Uh, where the values actually went at uh, a bad level. Now, they're significantly less and, and those growers are struggling to sell those wools and, and cover the costs of shearing. So in a nutshell, right about now, obviously what we're looking at, the market's reasonably consistent uh, in that trading range as I touched on. Uh, certainly moving forward, I, uh, I'm worried about what happens post Easter because of the volume of wool that's gonna be available, but it will certainly drop. Um, and while it drops, we'll be watching the market very, very closely. And if there is a bit of a rally in the market, my advice to growers and clients at the moment is um, certainly consider the price on offer. Um, if you're waiting for an extra dollar, I don't know when you're gonna see that.
but around these sorts of levels, um, you know, it's still sitting in that 90 plus decile range and, and I'd encourage growers to sell their wool. For any further information, by all means, please contact myself, Steve Squires or Tony Collins on the details below. Thank you. Thanks so much for that presentation, Greg. I really appreciate it, um, having a really, really nice video. Um, Greg is online and I'm sure if you're able to, you can come off video and give everyone a bit of a wave. Um, but if there's any questions for Greg, um, you can feel free to come off um, mute and, and, and bring on your video if you'd like um, and and or um, shoot through a message on the chat too. Um, um, but again, thank you so much, Greg, for that for that really, really good video. Um, and please come through if you have any questions. Just on that, the market report from today, we expected it to be a bit cheaper and it is cheaper. It's dropped probably only 10 to 20 cents, depending on your micron, of course. A uh, little bit less. Growers did pull a little bit out prior to sales. So about 53,000 bales on offer this week over the three days, Fremantle, Sydney, Melbourne. Um, so we did expect to see a little bit smaller. But then next week, we're currently looking at a 45, 48,000 bale offering. So... Not a lot of extra business done, but it does sound like uh, there's a bit of a shipping issue as in lack of boats coming in. So the stocks of wool are building, but on the port side, um, one buyer commented on Friday that he's got about 30 containers going out on the next boat. And uh, when you consider there's about 100 bales of wool in each container, that's a fair bit of capital tied up. So just a lot of things you've got to factor in when you're looking at markets. Terrific. Thanks, Greg, for that update. Um, and, and that's great video. Um, and if there's no more questions or no questions coming through, oh, we've got one on the chat. Um, um, Greg, any opinion about the price of livestock within a six months time frame? Based on the lack of joinings, I think the crossbred joinings are still going to be okay. And I was on the forecasting committee meeting yesterday. Um, I think the Crossbred numbers are probably going to be okay in the spring, but definitely the merino to merino joining is going to be well down. It's either a shorter joining period, and clients are talking three and a half to four and a half weeks versus the normal six or seven weeks, uh, or they didn't put the rams out at all. They've already got too much stock carried over. So based on that, I would suggest production levels of lambs, and the seasons, obviously, the spring was a bit tighter through the joining period as well. So we will see a bit of a drop in the actual lambing percentage um, so I would suspect there's going to be a bit of a shortage of land coming into the certainly the spring I think the crossbred supply will be okay initially but this time next year I think uh, there's not going to be anywhere near as many lambs around therefore lack of supply um, good demand and uh, that should help drive your prices up Mutton, however, I think is going to struggle for a bit. And the reason I say that is we've still got a lot of weathers in the mix. That's the hard one to gauge. How many weathers are actually out there on farm that haven't been able to get on a boat? Now, the, the older ones, as a general comment, I guess they've sort of moved through the system. But definitely last season's lambs are still in the mix. And uh, they're still going to be around for a little while, which will also keep our supply of wool up. Short term, but price of sheep, uh, breeding used, lambs lift, the price of your unit will probably lift as well. But I think Mark is still going to struggle for probably the next 12 months. So I hope that's answered your question. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks for the question. Um, all right, I'd like to thank Greg um, once more, and we might move on to introducing our next speaker. Um, over to Catherine. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg and Georgia. Um, so moving on now, um, we've got um, Richard George, who is a Senior Principal Research Scientist with DPERT, and Rich is going to talk about the WaterSmart Farms and the WaterSmart Dams programs. Over to you, Richard. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Georgia. Hi to everyone online. I'm just going to a little recap on the R&D we're doing at the moment into farm water and farm water management and supply options. I think... Um, uh, there's a little of time lag going on here. I'm not sure, Georgia, if you can see that. Um, we, you heard yesterday from Ian Foster a, a summary about the seasonal conditions. And um, I'm not, Georgia, can you just let me know if you can see the whole screen? I can't. There we go. Okay. Um, what Ian said yesterday is really what's laying out. So, climate, climate Futures is talking about a dry southwest corner 
and uh, a pretty good north and central part of the West Australian world. And my place, we've had three millimetres in six months, and uh, that's in that far southwestern corner. So I want to talk about the R&D we're doing to try and find water supplies for the wheat belt. So Water Smart Farms is a project where we're looking at a couple of tactical measures uh, to implement um, new water supply options. And I'm going to talk through two of those today, which is trying to find and access groundwater and also talk a little bit about desalination. And I'll show you some images of just some water supply options that we're testing around surface water supply. So we've got a consortium of groups uh, working together um, and agriculture water supply runs on around about 40 to 50 gigalitres of required water uh, on an annual basis. Perth uses about 400. Dams have been the centre stay of that water supply and on the right, that integrated steel pipe. But all supplies are coming under pressure um, from increased requirements. Water quality is a much greater parameter than it was several years ago. So we're trying to pick up the, the pace after a fairly long and quiet patch in R&D to find better and more useful water supplies. And particularly because of the requirements of spray rigs, um, farms, big farms are now are needing up to 60,000 litres a day to implement um, their herbicide programs. And uh, bigger uh, animal farms are needing even more than that. So in terms of what we have done to the wheat belt in the last 100 years, there's actually a couple of bright sides. I won't stay long on this graph, but we've been monitoring water tables in the wheat belt for 30 years or thereabouts, and we've added between two and 20 metres of water um, in thickness to the wheat belt. So we've actually, while it's dry on top, it's, uh, it's wringing wet underneath. So how can we use that opportunity? And the way we can use that opportunity is demonstrated in this picture. We have struggling with dams because of increased evaporation and increased demand. But in this picture is a bore and a desalination plant. And so our goal was to try and find the and increase the probability of getting successful low salinity water supplies out of bores and try and determine whether desalination is ready for the market. So in the way we started this project, um, Drilling across the wheat belt's been very haphazard um, and we've had very few technology advances to help farmers get more reliable supplies. And so what we did here is we took all the mining industry data that's been collected across the wheat belt, which is the top diagram, which is pictures of the geology at depth. The bottom left diagram is a picture of the soils, which I can give you a web app that you can get access to this data. And we've added one step, which is field-based exploration tools to try and give farmers the ability to drill sites with the highest probability of getting low salinity, um, high volume water supplies. And this is what I'll show you in a minute. So um, the, currently we're drilling 12 experimental sites between Tamman and, and, uh, and the West Coast um, into the fractured granites. Um, our success rate so far of the nine of 12 completers is seven out of those nine producing more than a, a litre a second or 80 tonnes a day. Four of those over three litres a second and all of those are stock water quality. So currently um, the method is holding and uh, we're doing work with some of the drillers to try and get this um, system adopted. But particularly for the Western wheat belt, um, the granite country, and particularly the areas of high sheep numbers. Um, this is proving reasonably successful. It's still early days, clearly it's pilot scale, um, but we've been working with other drillers to look at their success. And so far, these are 100 metre holes um, and uh, we're, we're, um, we're pretty happy with the results to date. And this has all been done in the last uh, 14 to 16 months um, R&D. The other angle that we're looking at is you can't always find water that's of stock quality. So what do you do if you do find water, um, but it isn't of a quality that you want and you need to treat that water? About 2014, desalination adoption started and limped along for a while, but it's gained a fair bit of pace through 2018 to 2020 in those couple of dry years. And these are just some of the sites where farmers have installed machines. We have um, been implementing four systems ourselves because we need to try and 
put units out where we can un understand their costs, um, their issues, their energy requirements, um, problem management, if you like. So we've got ones at Dumbly on Katanning and Meriden at the moment that are just implemented. And we have another at a school down near Esperance. And they're producing 10,000 to 70,000 litres a day um, at uh, saline water in most cases from 10 to 20,000 parts per million. So a third to two thirds seawater. And uh, all of those are presently operating and producing water for about two to five dollars a kilolitre, which is obviously much cheaper than carding and cheaper than water corps um, emergency supplies. And for operating costs, they're on a par with scheme water, but obviously you've got to count the, the cost of capital. Um, these technology units uh, ranging costs from about 20 to 30,000 up to this one, which is about 200,000. This is probably the most expensive and it's actually running a school. Um, and you get, this is completely solar powered and it's running about 40,000 to 30,000 liters a day off 120 panels. So this is a really, this is your upmarket version for about the cost of a uh, 300 series Land Cruiser and you can add a bit more. Um, so just in terms of it. Um, interesting thing about this is we now have properties, uh, which I'll give you an example of, uh, but first I'll do that. So we have to run a regulatory process around the adoption of these. I won't cover that now, but we have farmers um, looking at a range of systems about how to dispose of the salty water. And we're doing trials in that space, but I'll cover that another day. Um, one of the really interesting um, adoption patterns about some of the growers, we've got a very big grower up at uh, Ceres Farms at Wongan who's switched off his water corp supply, is producing 60,000 litres a day for his spray programs and believes he's paid the unit's capital cost off in the efficiency gains of um, his uh, herbicides. And we have another large grower with um, about 30,000 cheap at Cogena who has three units, four farms, 9,000 hectares of crop, as well as about um, 10 to 15,000 sheep. And they've gone to dams and desal. So adoption is really interesting and changing as, uh, as we see you know, climate impact water and water impact agriculture. So let me just summarize in the last minute or two um, what we're doing with surface water, because surface water is the, the bedrock of wheat belt um, water. There's 180,000 dams out there um, of various scales and sizes. And we have have AI systems available to us now to map them. Um, so traditionally, this is a partnership with grower groups. And I'll just say that there's a range of videos and podcasts available from Madfig, who has just finished a program with us. Follow this up. So we've gone from the history of collecting surface water in big um, rotor catchments. We're now experimenting with uh, plastic catchments and tanks. So this uh, the version up above, which has about the same water yield efficiency as the one below. Um, one takes up a third to a half a hectare, the other one takes up you know, five or six. So they're very different, but they're producing similar amounts of water. Um, we are looking at um, tarps and other options. So we've been uh, putting CBH tarps out um, as recycled plastics. Um, there's three of those on the south coast. This is an example at uh, Jacob that's flowing water on 0.6 of a millimetre of rain. Um, we're putting evaporative covers in, the cheap on the left, the deer on the right. Um, and these are sort of things that you use on your key dams. And finally, um, you know, the old um, tree belt protecting and, and ev preventing evaporation still has a place in farm water supply. And I'll wrap it up in two slides. Um, we had 20 years ago, we had a lot of farm water design tools that have largely been outdated. So we are now putting farm water design tools back so you can sit down with your contractors and work out what you do actually need and what your reliability and demand is. So those tools are available. And finally, to wrap it up, um, we're spending a lot of time looking at farm water quality and looking at the consequence of water quality on spray effectiveness. And we're talking to um, AWI and others about the consequence on animals. And that's a, that's a program R&D that's in the making at the moment. And I guess to complete, um, 
Some of the work that I've just talked about on dams and groundwater is summarized on our website. And we have these scannable QR code tools that are available. Um, and if you want any more information, Catherine or Georgia, I'm happy that people make contact after um, this video. Or as I said, Madfig is hosting a series of podcasts uh, and uh, you're welcome to go to that or the Water Smart Farms page on the DPIRD website. Thanks, Georgia. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks so much for that, Richard. Um, really appreciate you taking the time and there's some really good updates there. Um, we'll throw it open to any questions. Um, if anyone wants to come off mute, um, turn your video on or shoot through a message on the chat, please feel free. Um, otherwise, as Richard said, you can follow us up after this and um, you know shoot through any more questions once you've had a chance to digest all those resources and information. Can't see any questions at the moment. Um, so we'll move on to the next presenter. Thanks again, Richard, for that presentation. Um, so dry conditions are meaning that we're going to need to have some strategies and tactics in place for the season ahead. So we've got John Young here from Farming Systems Analysis Service, and he's going to speak through some of those options and considerations for the season. Over to you, John. Yes, thanks. Um, I've got the <clears throat> the uh, role of talking about strategies and tactics for the, the current tough season and got a lot of content to, to get through. So I'm um, glad that this is being recorded because I'm going to have to move reasonably quickly to um, to get it all through. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to start talking about what I think is required to, to manage the current situation and then provide some rules of thumb that, that will help um, help you making those decisions. So um, Ian Foster said yesterday that the, there was a probability was for sort of drier than normal April and May conditions with, with a return to more neutral conditions sort of late May and into, into June. So I sort of read that as um, that we're unlikely to get a, a break before mid to late May and possibly into into June. So that's the scenario that, if I use some examples later on, that that's the scenario that I'll be thinking about. So in, in previous years, we've we found from experience that that taking action early has has led to the best outcomes, both financially and and as Terry talked about yesterday, uh, mentally. So. So to make those decisions, I think we need to do a, a feed and water budget and, and keeping that up to date sort of ensures there's going to be fewer su surprises in, in future. So it helps you sort of decide whether you've got sufficient grain and and water for for some different scenarios for, for when you have to stop feeding based on the time of the break. Now I'm, I'm going to concentrate on the feed rather than the water because uh, Richard's just um, filled you in on the on the water story. So I, I'm going to cover on the feed feed story. So the the question is sort of do you have sufficient cash flow available to to purchase the the necessary feed? And at, at this time of year, energy is the is the limiting factor. So Feed, feed purchases should be sort of based on on the, the the cost of energy in cents per megajoule of metabolizable energy and and choosing the the cheapest option and, and but it is important to remember that if you're changing feeds uh, then then it might be necessary to introduce your stock to the new feed uh, efficient. Uh, feed allocation is is always important um, in any year, but it's going to be even more important this year. And I'll I'll talk about this again in a in a few minutes. <clears throat> but but that efficient feed allocation is about targeting um, or having targets for different classes of livestock, differentially feeding the animals to achieve those targets, 
and then monitoring the animals and adjusting your um, feeding rates to, to achieve your targets. So I'm going to talk about some of those things uh, in a few slides as well. Probably should have had on this slide, but it's not there, is to, to look after your animal health and to keep an eye on that. Um, the animal health is sort of usually things that are cheap to fix, but very expensive to ignore. So that's things like diseases, minerals, um, and, and water quality. <clears throat> so your budget and your decision about um, the grain that you require to get through to, to different scenarios of, of when the season um, allows you to stop feeding. The, the question is, is your cash flow okay? If, if, you've, if you've got sufficient grain on hand or sufficient capacity to buy grain, then, then you continue to focus on gross margin per DSE, which is your sort of normal um, livestock decision-making value. Whereas if your cash flow is limited, then, then your focus becomes on gross margin per dollar spent. And that dollar is both the husbandry cost, but also the, well, mainly the cost of the grain that's required. So, so if if uh, if you're in that basket, then then you start putting that as your lens on your decision making. Now, yesterday, Mark Ferguson talked about prioritising animals for sale, and which which we are higher priority animals to to retain, and. And, and if you didn't see that, I recommend reviewing reviewing his his comments. But the, the few things that I can add to what he said was that in the current market conditions, we suggest to, to sell your fatter animals and retain thinner animals if you're in a situation where you're, you need to sell animals. Um, there will be a production penalty associated with, with the lower condition score animals, but that's more than made up for uh, in differences in the current market price. Um, there's also be a bit of a saving in the maintenance requirement for those uh, thinner animals. And, and maybe those thinner animals were the ones that, that raised um, twin lambs last year. So there's a couple of reasons, a couple of extra reasons there for, for uh, retaining the thinner use. However, if you've done that, it, it's important to be vigilant about further weight loss. Those, those animals, if they're already thin, you need to be ensuring that they're not continuing to lose weight. Um, and, and also be vigilant at, at lambing time because those lambs will be a bit smaller at birth and a bit more vulnerable to, to lamb mortality. As Mark talked about yesterday, the, the reproducing ewes are a higher priority than than dry use um, because the dry use won't help you rebuild your flock next year. However, for, for some of you, if you're in a situation of having to feed um, a lactating ewe during, from, from the period from lambing to weaning, um, that, that requires a, a fair amount of energy and, and that would be about a break even operation if, if lamb stays at $4.50 a kilo. But, but as you heard Greg say, he, his sort of outlook and uh, he's reduced lamb supply. So therefore perhaps slightly stronger prices. So if price is above $4.50 a kilo for lamb next year, then, then feeding that ewe through lactation uh, will be a profitable exercise. <clears throat> So, so back to sort of efficient feed allocation, as I said, that it's always an important factor in, in livestock farming, but, but particularly important this year. So, so the steps that, that I think are necessary for this is to, you've, you've got to know some information and you've got to be able to implement it. So, so getting a feed test done on your grain so that you understand uh, your ration and hand in hand with this is is calibrating your feeding out equipment so you know how much you're you're putting out and and are able to adjust it if if necessary. So so that adjustment is is partly about monitoring the the live weight or condition score of the the animals and and then adjusting to achieve the targets. And I'll talk about targets in a couple of slides time. 
And so, so adjusting your feeding rate using your measured or your monitored live weight and condition score is better than just relying on on rules of thumb for for feeding rates. But I'll give you some feed, those rules of thumb in a few slides time as well. Um, if you're adjusting your your ration based on the live weight targets, it's it's going to be necessary to to allow if you've got pregnant ewes to allow for the growth of the conceptus. And that is, that's about 200 grams per head per day on average in, in the last month or, or two of pregnancy. Because um, our aim is to maintain the maternal live weight. So therefore the actual live weight needs to be increasing. Separating a, a tail and feeding them accordingly uh, is a good way to, to target your, um, your supplement dollar. And, and um, separating the good doers that are gaining weight could also be a, an efficient thing to do this year. <clears throat> sort of, um, I found well, my experience with feeding the tail is that often you don't need to offer the tail much more feed than you're offering them when they're in the larger mob. It's more about them having more time to consume. That, that tail is often the, the animals that eat slowly. And by the time they would have got their fill, the, all the rest of the animals have, have eaten it. So that, so they miss out. Um, but, but you can, we'll talk about that in, in, in a minute in the targets. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, pregnancy scanning also has some benefits this year. Um, selling or differentially feeding the, the dry ewes which I realise for some of you, pregnancy scanning is, is probably a little bit bit late, um, but but for others, it, it's still an option. And and it, it might also give you, expand some marketing options for you by being able to offer a, offer use that are scanned in lamb. Um, being able to differentially feed your twin bearing use is also important this year, as sort of talked about in the lifetime new management package. And, and perhaps fetal ageing would be an option that would allow you to, to focus your feeding around that sort of lambing and lactation time and tighten up your, your lambing window and tighten up the, the allocation of feeding. And, and this year might be a good year to look at trying to remove the ewes that lamb and lamb and lost and, and help, again, target that feeding through lactation. <clears throat> so I just want to backtrack a little bit now and provide you with some of the, the rules of thumb about doing your feed budgets and, and making adjustments. And we all know that, that sort of heavier animals require a bit more feed to maintain. So that, that's sort of included on this, this graph. The, the column that says megajoules per day, that's the, the requirement for animals of different live weight to, to maintain weight. The, the lower number on the, the range, so taking the 65 kilo animal as an example, which is probably a pretty typical size for, for a lot of you that are in the audience for your use, sort of the, the lower number, nine megajoules per kilo, is, is more like what you might be feeding in confinement. Eleven is more about what you might be feeding if they're out in the in the paddock, spending expending energy walking back and forward looking for, for some pasture to eat. That sort of number converts into, if we've got reasonable quality grain, uh, around 24 kilos of, of grain per month, which at four and a half cents per megajoule, which is good quality grain at $600 a ton fed out, is about $14 um, per month. So if we're looking at sort of two to three months of, of supplementary feeding, um, then we're looking at sort of 48 to 72 tons of feed per thousand dry animals on the farm. So, so that's the sort of amount of feed that's going to be required um, for your flock for a thousand for each thousand animals on the farm. And then we need to add the energy budget for reproduction. So, so total energy required for pregnancies around four hundred megajoules, lactation around eight fifty. So, so that's another for a thousand new flock. 
another 33 tonnes of grain for a thousand ewes to, to cover pregnancy and another 70 tonnes to, to cover lactation if, if you're having to provide a full ration during pregnancy and lactation. Um, a few more rules of thumb and talking about the, the targets, the, the, the main target or the, the likely target is, is aiming for, for live weight maintenance. It usually doesn't pay to gain weight uh, using, using grain, and, but there's two, um, two exceptions to this rule of live weight maintenance. The first is you can allow some slow live weight loss or for, for dry sheep to it down to a minimum of around condition score two. And the exception to gaining weight using grain is for uh, mated ewes that are less than about condition score 2.3 that, that are high risk of, of mortality at lambing. Uh, particularly if they're, they're twin bearing ewes, those animals could can justify slow live weight gain using feed. Um, now, I've talked before about monitoring the, the live weight and condition score and adjusting your, your feeding rate to, to in, in account. So if you've got some animals that are gaining a bit of weight and you, your aim is maintenance, for every 10 grams that they're gaining, you can be reducing the, the, uh, the ration by sort of 0.8 to 1.1 megajoules per head per day, which is sort of 25 to sorry, 60 to 100 grams of, of supplement per day reduction. If you've got animals that are losing weight while aiming for maintenance, then you need to increase the feeding rate by 0.3 to 0.4 megajoules per head per day for each 10 grams that they're losing. So that's another, or adding it sort of 25 to 30 grams to, to their supplement uh, allowance. Um, now, Audrey's going to talk in a moment about her experiences with confinement feeding. I just want to reiterate the, the value of confinement feeding because I think it's uh, an important tactic to use this year. So the first three points on the, on the screen there are the, are the short-term advantages or benefits of, of having confinement, and they need to be weighed up against the costs of setting up a confinement lot if you don't have one already. Um, probably the big one that uh, but it's hard to put a value on is, is the value of maintaining ground cover to reduce erosion and re uh, both wind erosion and, and, and runoff. Um, it's, it's quite dependent on, on soil type and, and environment and whether, you, whether it's windy, how, how quickly the rain falls when you get the when, the, when you get the break, but it, it's a big consideration um, in the value of confinement feeding in a situation like we've got this year where, where there's very little paddock cover. Um, the other advantage this year when we're staring down the barrel of the late break is the ability to defer pastures at the break of season and allow them, allow the pastures to get some leaf area and, and start uh, growing so that you can um, get the animals out onto the green feed and, and cut down your requirement to, to feed. So, so Michael Young uh, did some case study analysis of a, an MLA producer demonstration site carried out by the Sterling to Coast Farmer Group. And, and in all the case studies that, that he evaluated, it, there was a positive gross margin for, for um, confinement feeding of sort of one to four dollars, and that was in normal seasonal conditions. So, so in a year like this, we'd expect um, expect greater greater gains. So it, it's likely to be a, a tough couple of months, but but do remember to prepare for next season as well. Um, maybe expand your cropping program if you've if you had to sell sheep. Um, prepare for seeding, so you've got timely crop establishment and and hopefully you can make sort of 24 25 year a, a winner and, and then we can relegate sort of 23 24 into the into the useful experience basket
Thank you. Is um, any questions or we? Thanks so much, John, for that presentation. Um, a lot of really good content there. Um, yeah, please feel free to, to chuck questions in the chat or, or come off mute and turn your video on. Um, and um, I'm sure John wouldn't mind hanging around for the last few minutes if anyone chucks through questions um, sh over, over the chat too. Yeah, certainly lots of, of information to absorb. So feel free to go back and re revisit the recording when we share it um, later. But um, thanks again, John, for, for all that information. It was really helpful. Um, and um, Catherine will introduce our next speaker unless there's anyone wanting to jump in with a question now. No one's jumping in? All right. Um, so thanks, John, very much for that. Um, that confinement feeding at the end is a good segue into the next presentation. So um, we've got Audrey Bird, who's the sheep producer from Wikipen here, to speak about um, feeding in confinement um, with Caitlin Anderson from the FACI group. So thank you, Audrey. Thanks, Catherine, and welcome, everybody. Um, just like to give you a bit of background as to our farming enterprise. Uh, we're a farm family business, a uh, farm with my, my son and my daughter-in-law daughter in, in, in Wickerpen at 230k southeast of Perth, um, <clears throat> 5,000 hectares of which five to 600 are, are for sheep over the winter period and the remainder area is, is cropped. Uh, we have a six-month growing season with annual growing season rainfall of around 300 mils. And our flock consists of around 2,000 mated merino ewes, being a self-replacing flock. Uh, the reasons for confining sheep destocking paddocks may be different to other enterprises, but for us it is because we don't want to bear out paddocks and we wanted to make our sheep enterprise more profitable. So why we do it? Confining our sheep flock became a critical part of our livestock enterprise when we changed to later lambing. From the last week in May, um, lambing to the last week in June, July, with a five week joining period. We changed the lambing time because of the cost of supplementary feeding, which was our biggest enterprise cost due to the feed requirements of the earlier lambing. It is cheaper to grow grass than it is sup to supplementary feed. And we can't confine ewes unless we put back the lambing dates as we will not lamb in confinement. And with a May season break, the grass needs time, time to grow. Can we have the next one, please? Yep. <clears throat> Confining our sheep prior to lambing and later lambing allows us to grow and defer pastures. This for us has been a critical management change that we have made to ensure that ewes can produce plenty of milk for the lambs and that the lambs have increased growth rates for the abundance of green feed. We seed all our pastures with cereals, either oats or barley, and our legume pasture seed. And we have a disc, disc seeder and as of Friday, we had all the 600 hectares already planted, um, dry seeded. Um, and the fact that we know that early grown cereals have 30% more energy than our typical pastures for every kilo of regular pastures. So that is really crucial for, for a lambing ewe. Our confinement area consists of four small pens with 1,200 to 1,400 ewes in one hectare total with laneways where the feed troughs are. Pen sizes are roughly 80 metres by 120 metres, and I would call it a basic setup. Um, I think it's been there for 16, 18 years. It was a, a feed lot that we um, just took out some internal fences and just utilising it now. <clears throat> You'll see in the photographs there that we do have some self feeders, but they don't have any grain in them. Uh, water quality and high volume of water is available as sheep on total grain hay diet drink a lot of water at at least six litres per day is what we found. 
I feed a ration of pellets into troughs and good quality hay, feeding pellets every second day and the hay the next. I calculate the energy requirements for the lifetime wool U chart and feeding will take me an hour and a half to two hours a day. I'm not required for the seeding aspect. So I, I can, yeah, there is a labour unit available to, to feed sheep in confinement, but I'm sure it's a lot more time efficient feeding sheep all in one area rather than traveling um, 10 kilometers round trip to feed them all. Um, <clears throat> sheep feeder has scales on it to ensure that the correct amount of pellets are given. That's fairly crucial. I won't use self feeders or restricted feeders as too costly to feed ad lib feed and unrestricted feed access may be detrimental to shy feeders, creating problems later on, especially at lambing time. Use a scan in April to identify um, to identify dry singles and multiples, and it's recorded against their EID tag and automatically recorded by the person doing the scanning. Generally, by the first week in May, use are drafted up into the preg status so that the feed ration can be adjusted to cater for the multiple lammers. Use below condition score two and a half are drafted off as they will receive a higher ration to ensure that during lambing, they don't give me trouble. All ewes are drenched with a long-acting drench, given their booster clostodial needle. And for the last two years, I've also given the multiple bearing ewes a, a multi-min vaccine. I've had some interesting results there. Because I use pellets, the ewes can go straight onto a full ration on day one, reducing the stress level and introductory time for the feed. By day three, all the sheep are very settled in their small pens. By feeding every day, I keep an eye on the health of the sheep and can treat any sick ones or ones that are losing body condition. Depending on how the season is going and how the pastures are growing, by end of May, early June determines how long the sheep stay in confinement. The maximum is five weeks. Introduction onto green feed is started around uh, day three before they let out of the small pens. Probably should be longer, but I've had good success, never had any trouble just with my three days. Uh, we have a five hectare paddock next to the feedlot that the ewes are allowed to access for a short period of time um, to in introduce them to grass and green feed, important for the bacteria in the gut to adjust. I give them their pellets or hay ration first to ensure that they have full bellies before going out onto the grass for an hour or so. Once sheep leave, conf leave the confinement area, I never feed them again as they don't need it. Well, they haven't in the last three years anyway. Thanks, Caitlin. So our results um, and outcomes from the confine confinement. We've had very low losses in confinement, two to three ewes a year. Um, and I think Part of that is because of the pellet rather than grain um, would be my observation. Uh, I've reduced the cost of supplementary feeding resulting in a more profitable enterprise. So because we are not um, putting high rates of, of energy to the sheep running around a paddock, um, we've been able to um, reduce significantly our supplementary feeding costs. We've improved the condition of our sheep flock as replacement young ewes also go into confinement. Less disturbance at lambing due to not supplementary feeding and less lambing issues, which I put down to ewes in, in better condition. Better growth rate in, in lambs. Um, I think that's the reason why a lot of wheat belt farmers don't go to later lambing is because they don't want to a young underweight lamb going into going into summer. However, I've been very surprised and very impressed with the growth rates that, that we have had. Um, <clears throat> I weigh all my lambs at, at weaning time as they're coming off mum. And the average for the merino lambs is, is 32 kilos and for our first cross in 35 kilos. And that's weaning in early October. 
Um, often too much feed, too much green grass for sheep to eat, which is a great problem to have. And it seems rather strange to be talking about that at the moment, but it does happen. Um, and we do use electric hot wire sometimes to fine tune our, our, uh, our grazing. And we have really good paddock ground cover if we manage it well, um, which is for us as important heading into summer. And that's a, a quick overview of, of what we do here. Thank you. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Kate Lynn from the FACI group. So, Audrey is one of my host farmers for our confinement and deferred grazing project that we're currently running. We're into our second year, um, so still analysing some of the data and we'll probably need a bit more data to make any conclusive statements about the project, but our website does have a list of a lot of the resources that quite a few people have mentioned um, today and a bit about the project. So, um, yeah, if you're after a bit more information, definitely jump onto the website. Quickly put the link in the chat for anyone listening. Um, but, yeah, a lot of good resources on there. And if you keep a track of it, um, there should be a webinar with... Charles Sturt University on a bit more of the technical knowledge, I guess, on confinement feeding. But yeah, Audrey's always a great insight. She's been doing it for quite a while now. So yeah, any questions, feel free to shoot. Yeah, thanks, Audrey. Um, so Audrey and Caitlin, um, yeah, just to reiterate, if anyone wants to come off mute, turn your camera on, chuck through a message in the chat, please feel free. Um, we've got one that's just come through. How many animals were you putting in each 80 by 100 pen? Yep, around the uh, around 350. Thanks for that question, Phil. Audrey, you did say you had some interesting results with your vaccine. What were interesting about it? Um, one of my hobby horse subjects is the loss that we have in our sheep system between scanning and marking, which uh, for the last five years, it's, it's averaged 30%. So anything I can do to try and minimise that loss is something that I want to work on. Um, and, yeah, I've, I've had some, some um, less losses, shall we say, with the, with the uh, mineral min. But, yeah, that's just a farm trial. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not about to recommend it, but, yeah, it's um, anything I can do to, to minimise that loss. And it's certainly something that I think uh, MLA and AWI still need to do a lot of work on because um, it's from an animal welfare point of view, it's it's not acceptable. So, yeah. All righty. Um, thanks so much again, Audrey and Caitlin. Um, fantastic presentation and... Um, uh, we'll move on to the to the next section, which is um, basically just me giving a bit of a wrap. So uh, I just wanted to to say um, that if you could please stay on for a, a two, three more minutes, that would be really appreciated. We've also got a quick poll at the end for any feedback, which will take you all 30 seconds a minute to complete. So please hang on for a few more minutes if you can. Um, but just to, to close out today, um, I wanted to draw everyone's attention to um, some upcoming um, events um, that AWI Extension WA will be running, and, and I'm in the process of organising as we speak. But um, we will be um, running um, our Simplify um, Strategic Fly Strike Management Workshop um, in July. Um, the locations of those workshops are to be advised, but um, if anyone's got any requests or suggestions, please feel free to, to send those through. But we'll be running those Simplify workshops in July, um, as well as ramping up Repro, um, so how to get the best performance from your RAM um, those workshops will be coming to you um, your, in your locations around WA um, from in July. Um, in August, September, 
Um, we'll be doing um, yeah, Winning with Wieners also um, and another Ramping Up Repo um, workshop, um, just doing them over those few months as well. So please um, keep your eyes and ears peeled for those um, upcoming workshops and, and please register when those links come out. Um, as always, please keep in touch and stay up to date. Um, hopefully you're all following us on, on Facebook, on AWI Extension WA. Um, you would have noticed the, the rebranding um, of AWI Extension WA. Um, so if you followed the, the old provider, um, you'll still be following us. Um, so just make sure you're, you're on there, as well as subscribe to our emails and newsletter. We release a, a quarterly newsletter. So make sure that you subscribed. Um, you can see our website there, awiextensionwa.com. So, so please check those out. Um, additional support and resources, we just wanted to share these here. Um, um, to, to build upon what we've provided you in yesterday's webinar and today's webinar. So please um, check these out um, for additional support and resources. Um, you can scan those QR codes or just take a photo of those now um, if you'd like, um, but we'll be sharing this with you later as well. Um, and also this is the, 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 the additional rural support services here. Um, for, for everyone experiencing any issues in these tough times, um, we, we encourage you to reach out and, and utilize all the resources and support there is. Um, so just finally, just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining in person today and also who's watching this recording after the fact. We really appreciate you leaning in and, and please um, could you complete the very quick poll to give us any feedback on today's session, but on behalf of DPIRD and AWI Extension WA, we'd really like to thank you all for attending. And as I said, please fill out the short poll um, to give us some feedback and, and please put through any suggestions you might have. Um, and um, we'll look to try and take that feedback and suggestions on board for future events. So thank you very much for attending. <laughs>